Welcome back, everybody. This is part two of our 2021 ALA presentation from the Emerson Society. Uh, we're doing things virtually this year, so thanks for tuning in to the recorded version. Um, if you have not already done so, we invite you to please join the Emerson Society. In doing so, you will be supporting all of our good works, including lots of um, wonderful awards and prizes for scholars emerging and established and promoting study of Emerson and uh, um, other figures associated with him. And um, we would appreciate your continued support. So thank you. Right now we're gonna begin our second panel, which is in fact a round table discussion. And uh, our topic is Emerson studies now, a particularly timely topic as we think about um, really a moment, I think, of important generational shift in the scholarship as um, in the, the editorial work on Emerson's manuscript materials has been concluded and now we're all able to access them and do new work and think about Emerson in new ways. At the same time, important conversations are happening within the fields that we're all part of as a whole about decolonization, about new attention to critical race theory and inclusion of all points of view. Where does Emerson fit into all of those discussions and where does he fit in institutionally in the various contexts in which we all encounter him? So those are, those are some of the questions that certainly I have about Emerson studies now and I'm sure that our panelists will bring their own unique perspectives to this issue as well. Um, I want to take a moment before we be begin to introduce our panelists. I'll go through them one by one, and then I will hand things over to them, and they can offer their perspectives. And then after that, we'll open the floor and hopefully have a wide-ranging discussion. So first of all, we have Chris Hanlon. Chris is Professor of United States Literature at Arizona State University and the author of America's England, Antebellum Literature and Atlantic Sectionalism and Emerson's Memory Loss, Originality, Communality, and the Late Style, both from Oxford University Press. He is currently editing the Oxford Handbook of Ralph Waldo Emerson, to which many people here are contributing, and his essays on 19th century literature and culture have appeared in many venues, including American Literary History, American Literature, The New York Times, and the LA Review of Books. Joseph Urbas is our current Emerson Society program chair. And he teaches American literature and Anglo-American philosophy at the Université Bordeaux Montaigne. His most recent book entitled The Philosophy of Ralph Waldo Emerson was published by Routledge in September of 2020. After Joseph, we'll be hearing from Michael Jonick who teaches American literature and contemporary critical theory at the University of Sussex. He has published Herman Melville and the Politics of the Inhuman from Cambridge University Press, and he writes on pre-1900 American literature and philosophy. Mm -hmm. He is now editing the new Cambridge Companion to Ralph Waldo Emerson and co-editing the Oxford Handbook of Herman Melville. He's a founding member of the British Association of 19th Century Americanists and reviews and special issues editor for the journal Textual Practice. Last but not least, Prentice Clark is an associate professor of English at the University of South Dakota. Her book, Ralph Waldo Emerson, A Literary Companion, is forthcoming from McFarland. And she's currently completing essays for the new Cambridge Companion to Ralph Waldo Emerson and the Oxford Handbook of Ralph Waldo Emerson. She's also working on a monograph titled Measures of Intimacy, Emerson to Du Bois to Baldwin, a portion of which appears in the James Baldwin Review and I should also mention that she is currently the president elect of the Emerson Society and beginning in January will be the society's president. So thank you all for joining us. I look forward to the discussion. Uh, Chris. Thank you, Bonnie. And, um, and, and thanks everyone for coming here. I, it, it's delightful to be with you talking about Emerson in the midst of this um, horrible panic. <laughs> um, a reminder of the way life used to be and the way hopefully it'll be, it'll become soon. Um, I want to thank my colleagues in the Emerson Society for this timely panel and I especially 
especially want to thank uh, Prentice and Joseph for joining me in this discussion. Uh, my title suggests that I will be talking about the Oxford Handbook of Ralph Waldo Emerson, which at 45 chapters and 48 contribu contributors will be a variegated collection of essays. But since I'm editing this volume with some particular circumstance in mind concerning Emerson and the wider field, I'd like to talk about the collection by talking about those circumstances. Um, how do the status of Emerson now in, um, within the field of Americanist and transatlantic literary studies in 2021? Do worse than to approach the question in quantitative and comparative terms. And I'd like to share my screen with you just for a moment. Right. Um, any discussion of Emerson's currency should notice that between January of 2016 and virtually this afternoon, 75 articles mentioning Emerson were published in peer reviewed journals listed in the MLA International Bibliography. In order to get a sense for this scale of productivity, let's divide that number by the 185 peer reviewed articles mentioning Melville published during the same period. In other words, during the past five years, Emerson has cited in peer reviewed scholar 40% as often as Melville. If we're talking about peer reviewed articles whose title actually includes either name, during the same period, Emerson fell even further behind at six articles compared with 23 for Melville. That's Melville outpacing Emerson by about 75% or a ratio of uh, uh, three to one. In non peer reviewed edited collections during this period, Melville out circulated Emerson at a more moderate but still decisive 61% providing the primary focus for 14 chapters to Emerson's four. And by the way, and I don't bring this up to be ironic or cute, but since the beginning of 2016, peer-reviewed scholarship on Melville has also outpaced Emerson by a ratio of three to one, even in the formerly named Emerson Society Quarterly, which as no uh, ESQ. Um, but this is the Emerson Society, not the Melville Society. If, if Melville tasks me and heaps me, it's only because I see in this asymmetry certain loomings. Call it an outrageous strength with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. Um, consider these relative rates, all of the, uh, how these relative, uh, relative rates of scholarly output track roughly with the likely portions of time dedicated to each author as revealed in Maurice Lee's survey of surveys published in 2016-19. Lee's findings gleaned from his analysis of 131 syllabi from a variety of instructors, institutions, and regions reveal that during the prior year, Mel up an average of 11.5% of assigned pages during the term as compared with 7.5% um, for Emerson. Now, one response to what I extract from Lee's report might be to say, in effect, who cares? Surely the most important of Lee's findings concern the divergence of pedagogical and scholarly commitment that reflects in the fact that the top decile of taught writers are essentially still Matthiessen's pantheon from American Renaissance plus Dickinson, Poe, Douglas, Jacobs, Stowe, and Irving. That top decile, Lee demonstrates, took up 72% of class time in 2015. We should be more concerned about Margaret Fuller getting only 1.1% of class time or Francis Harper getting only 0.32%. Still bear with me as I persist with Emerson and Melville. Uh, last uh, at the biennial convention of the Association of 19th Century um, Americanists, six papers went by titles that include Melville's name, that, uh, sorry, that include Melville's name. Only one title named Emerson. And that paper argued that Benito Mussolini took political inspiration from Emerson, which for all I know could well be the case, uh, but consider that sole representation of Emerson focused scholarship alongside the kinds of papers on Melville that helped to shape that 2020 meeting of Simon. Those titles included Branka Arshik's Melville's Supple Solids, which took up Melville's conceptualizations of the fluid planet, 
Sari Altschuler's Melville's Mutiny, Benito Serino, Deaf Culture and the Language of Signs, which as the title would suggest, approached Melville from a perspective of disability studies, or Caitlin Sheehan's Save the Whales, Melville and the Geohistorical Presence, which again, perhaps obviously, brought Melville into an intersection of animal studies, climate criticism, and time studies. So in the time I have left, I'd like to offer and elaborate two summary statements concerning the absenting of Amory I described, but very much behind the proposal I submitted to Oxford for the Emerson Handbook. The first is this is how you drive a writer once considered essential the way of the fireside poets. Emerson studies right now is flagging because of a reluctance among too many scholars who write about him either to engage in the debates on 19th century literary studies that energize the field currently, or to connect their work with those who are driving those debates. And this is troubling for reasons that have nothing to do with chasing trends or replicating outre critical modes, much less in the curriculum. Because in fact, and this is my second statement today on which I'd like to spend a bit more time, surveying the current assemblage of critical orientations in C-19 American studies one not but recognize that Emerson belongs near the center of almost all of the most active discussions underway, not on or beyond their periphery altogether. Take what, must be, what might be the most vital of these discussions, the wide ranging capacious examination of the way 19th century United States literature addresses itself to matters concerning what we now call church. Leaving aside Emerson's general interest in nature and natural, why have there been no articles was published on Emerson that focused directly on the subject of energy extraction. The chapter titled Wealth in the Conduct of Life begins with a poem in which Emerson specifically extracts fuels, asking, quote, who saw what ferns and palms were pressed under the tumbling mountain's breast in the safe herbal of the coal? From economies of extraction, Emerson continues, quote, the temples rose and towns arts, the shop of toil, the hall of arts, the sail across the seas to feed the north from tropic trees. Or think of the emerging emphasis among environmental humanists on literary engagements with energy infrastructure, while recalling that moment from English traits where Emerson reader with the superior speed of British locomotives allegedly left detailing miles traveled on the American trains that made possible not only his career as an orator, but Lyceum culture itself. Or think of the very notion of the Anthropocene along Emerson's own reckoning of the possibility of planetary ecological change. Observing the pollution produced in England through the burn of coal, the fine soot, he writes, darkens the day, gives white sheep the color of black sheep, discolors the human saliva, contaminates the air, poisons many plants, and corrodes the monuments and buildings. Emerson then supposes that, quote, the enormous consumption of coal on the island may be the effect of modifying the general climate. For that matter, Emerson sometimes connected his muse on fossil fuels with the kinds of massive timescales why she has urged literary scholars toward in her work on deep time in her suggestion that literary scholars begin to think in time scales much broader than those in which nation states and national let alone all that important. The winds and the rains come back a thousand, thousand times, he contends in his 1862 address titled Perpetual Forces. The coal in your grate gives out in decomposing today exactly the same, light of, same amount of light and heat which was taken from the sunshine in its formation in the leaves and boughs of the antediluvian tree. There are other critical conversations underway in our field where for some reason, Emerson is largely not on scene, though one would expect to see him. What does Emerson's consequential encounter with the taxidermied species in the Jardin de Plantes in Paris have to offer scholars who work in the subfield of animal studies? Literary historians of abolition have demonstrated the invalidity of any assessment of the movement that does not simply include, but actually focus on the black press. Why have we been so disinterested in how Emerson's reputation and writings were circulated in publications like the Christian Recorder, the Anglo-African or Frederick Douglass's paper? For that matter, conversations over race and emancipation have in the last few years turned against 1865, to quote the influential phrase of Cody Mars and Christopher Hager, who point out that the project of abolition extended, extends well beyond the Civil War. 
The people working on Whitman, Douglas, and Harper all seem to understand that since the end of the Civil War is in many ways the beginning of the struggle, not its terminus, the musings of US writers over the possibilities for post-war America cry out for examination. Whitman, Harper, and obviously Douglas have loomed large in these discussions, and yet again, Emerson has been less so, though he wrote much about post-war America and its prospect for black lives. Having invoked all these interventionist ways of reading, some may think of as merely fashionable. Let me end referencing someone no one would accuse of that, Robert Spiller, who famously contended in the preface to his literary history of the United States, that all we ever do as professional readers is to reinvent American literature in order to serve the needs of a current generation. I am not suggesting that absolutely no one is engaging the matters toward which I gesture, but run the numbers and it sure looks like Emerson is lagging. And if it isn't clear now, um, I'll sit that baldly on us. Hey, as Jeffrey Insko has pointed out, Emerson himself urges us to consider that, quote, without the prospect of the new, without something that happens, something that unsettles present and past alike, there can be no time and thus nothing to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And next, uh, Michael. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, uh, to the organizers, the Emerson Society, uh, especially to Joseph, Bonnie, and, and Michael uh, for all their work and getting things together for today. Um, I think it's an interesting moment in, in rethinking the question of philosophy in particular in Emerson studies, as we recalibrate our, our picture of him after a playing out of sorts of the legacy of Cavell's earlier characterization of Emerson's challenge to philosophy, uh, influential strong readings such as Cameron's Impersonality or Branka Arsic's Vital Materialism or other work that's put him in relationship to classical and neo-pragmatism. For some, uh, this has included inserting or reasserting his idealism and ontology and in some cases theology, uh, hopefully as well, often elided by the epistemological and materialist approaches. Uh, Joseph Orbas, of course, has given us a double book, a double gift of two books that have eloquently insisted on and unfolded Emerson's ontological commitments. Uh, but there's also Hervig Friedel, uh, Tomas Constantinesco, Daniel Follett, et cetera, who are also thinking around Emerson and philosophy, just to name a brief few. Whether this will ferment into a kind of uh, new idealisms to rebut the new materialisms, I'm not sure, but I, I can hope. This uh, philosophical recalibration is just one impetus uh, for the new Cambridge Companion to Ralph Walter Emerson, which uh, I'm editing. And I can talk about this later, but I'm, I'm you know, really thrilled to hear what Chris has said around the sort of circumstances and, and how we might redress them. And, and first off, I apologize if I've uh, you know, entered into the world uh, too many Melville articles to, to tip that balance. I hope my penance can be in you know, uh, joining with Chris and also Prentice's volumes and bringing another, you know, a, a great moment of groundswell of numbers that we can you know, tip the scales perhaps uh, the other way. Um, and, and in that, and I can talk about this later, as I say, in that Cambridge Companion, I want to really rethink collectively Emerson across the board. And it does have a lot of resonances with some things that Chris is working on and thinking about among his contributors in terms of a decolonized or decarbonized Emerson, Emerson and Climb and the Anthropocene, uh, gender and race, Emerson and information and media, sensation and creativity, political economy, China, et cetera. So I think that, you know, we won't have this conversation in, in five years or hopefully less than that when these books are out because there'll be a different balance. In my own work, uh, I explore Emerson in the context of post-Kantian philosophy and natural science, especially Goethe, Hegel, and Faraday without falling into, I hope, the either ors of characterizing him as or not as a philosopher or as systematic and non-systematic. I'm especially interested in how terms like intellect, intuition, perception, instinct, et cetera, place him as part of the broader philosophical story of how we understand the evolution of complex intelligence. Increasingly, I see Emerson as part of a genealogy of non-calculative thinkers at the intersection of philosophical, scientific, and literary modes of thinking. To this end, today I'll just talk briefly to Adam Bright what I mean by his poetic thinking and how that might work in our particular moment uh, in rethinking Emerson's philosophy. So in reading philosophical texts, Emerson seeks a certain catalytic power. He says, I read Proclus and sometimes Plato as I might read a dictionary for a mechanical help to the fancy and the imagination. 
perhaps like Feuerbach's notion of Invicus Fagkeit or capacity for elaboration of the genuine philosophical element of every work, Emerson sees the power of thinking as the elaboration of the impersonal force or luster in a philosophical work. He says, this is also intellect. It is not Proclus, but a piece of nature and fate that I explore. It is a greater joy to see the author's author than himself. But if a new doctrine seems at first a subversion of all our opinions, tastes, and, and manner of living, a philosopher's excess of influence feeds the mind only insofar as it serves as a point of departure for thinking and not thinking's resting place. To leave is to receive, and the compensation is to think against the rigidity of inherited philosophical systems. And so Emerson privileges this elaborative reading of philosophy so to honor a thinker by use over a systematic or axiomatic reading of philosophy. He reformulates this in Powers of the Mind. He says there, even if our theory be wrong, thoughts are things that require no system to make them pertinent, but they make everything else impertinent. In writers and philosophers, it is not propositions that are of the first need, but to watch and tenderly cherish the intellectual and moral sensibilities. The task of thinking for Emerson is to conduct and bear witness, to articulate a refulgent truth a fact in the nature of things and to watch and tenderly cherish the intellectual and moral sensibilities or elsewhere what he calls the moral sentiment to seduce right thoughts and dwell with them. For Cavell, Emerson's non-systematicity is an instability that poses a challenge to philosophy and constitutes Emerson's capture of philosophy for America. This is of course, you know, uh, famous. Uh, he celebrates Emerson's aversive thinking as a thinking that is provocative and unsettling is a partial act and an act of parting. Aversive thinking works both in terms of one's own moral perfectionism and self-culture and as a skeptical philosophical posture. But even if we accept Cavell's picture of Emerson's philosophy as an aversive thinking, at the same time, Emerson's poetic thinking resists Cavell's defense of him as, as a philosopher. In Poetry and Imagination, Emerson goes so far to say that the critic, the philosopher, is a failed poet. Poetry for Emerson is the piety of the intellect. As with the lusters for which he reads, poetry provides an intellectual catalyst. He says, is not poetry the little chamber in the brain where is generated the explosive force which by, which by gentle shocks sets in action the intellectual world. He calls for a poetry which tastes the world and reports of it, upbuilding the world again in the thought. And he puts his trust in the genius of Swedenborg and Wordsworth to be the agents of a reform in philosophy. Unsurprisingly then, the genealogy of thinkers Emerson offers in powers of the mind who abide by the intellectual and moral sensibilities is populated by writers and not philosophers. He says, it is Montaigne, Pascal, Montesquieu, even Moliere who make each a contribution to mental philosophy and not D'Alembert, Condillac or Geoffroy, Shakespeare, Goethe and Wordsworth not Hobbes or Hartley or Spinoza. This is Emerson still, the analytic mind never carries us on, taking to pieces is the trade of those who cannot construct." End quote. It is not the analytic mind of the philosopher which severs relations into elements, but the poetic mind of the writer which unsettles state connections, creates new relations and advances mental philosophy. Key to Emerson's poetic thinking then is not only how and to what extent we can know the physical world, but also how intellect co-constructs or co-conducts the fluid world in which it finds itself. Thus his poetic thinking entails a fluid theory of perception that allows for an ongoing reciprocity between the particular natural facts and general knowledge, what he calls the poetic perception of metamorphosis. The poetic perception of metamorphosis opens a way of thinking that can proceed to animate the last fiber of organization, as he says uh, in the Goethe essay. It is a relational thinking in which phenomena are defined not as fixed quantities, but as living poetic interconnections, ontologically united in a perfect identity or parallelism between the laws of nature and the laws of thought. This perfect identity resists Cavell's reading of Emerson as a skeptic, a posture he does countenance, but which it would be difficult to say he definitively adopts. As Joseph Orbus contends in Emerson's Metaphysics, Cavell overstates Emerson's skeptical mood at the expense of the moral sentiment. Joseph writes, 
where skepticism and its superficial views emphasize ontological estrangement and intellectual powerlessness, the Emersonian moral sentiment emphasizes a deep empowering continuity of self and world, end quote. Moral sentiment is consonant with the poetic perception of metamorphosis. It is the impersonal glimmer of fate and nature he finds in reading Proclus, or it is the impersonal flow of being which subtends the self of self-reliance, a self far from personalism or liberal individualism. Here, Emerson is perhaps closer to the ancient Stoics than the skeptics. The Stoics hold that perceptions or sensory impressions, fantasiae, could be illusory, but that the mind nonetheless is capable of comprehensive perceptions, what they call cataleptic fantasiae. Emerson privileges stoic catalepsis or true perception over skeptical acatalepsis or doubt that there could be such perception. In terms of experience, we may live in a world of contrary tendencies and incidental hits, surfaces and illusions, but we can nonetheless, to the power of our minds, apprehend and truly know the moral sentiment. And this is experience, the consciousness in each man is a sliding scale, which identifies him now with the first cause and now with the flesh of his body, life above life in infinite degrees. Far from a fine Pyrrhonism in which perceptions are acataleptic and objects cannot be known, moral sentiment rather combines with the poetic perception of metamorphosis into an experimental affirmative poetic thinking. To think then is to be attuned to the thought of creative becoming that flows through us and undoes us as it undoes all things. This thinking is realized at the level of, the, of form and expression. Emerson's words themselves are undulatory and fluid and should they be cut like the living words he celebrates of Montaigne, they would bleed. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And now um, we're turning to Prentice, please. Hi everyone, is sound okay? I had to run to my office last minute this morning. Sounds good. good. Okay, um, thank you to Joseph for organizing these timely panels and to Bonnie for her service as Emerson Society president during a very difficult year. Um, so with an eye towards this discussion based format, um, my paper truly takes the informal form of several observations and many questions, genuine, not rhetorical. Um, and they're all sort of clustered around the topics of relevance, paradigms, and pedagogy, specifically in the context um, of the Emerson Society. While completing Ralph Waldo Emerson, a literary companion for McFarland's 19th century companion series, I had the privilege, pleasure, and task of returning to and seeing anew Emerson scholarship from the 19th century to now. To encounter Emerson through the lenses of a reception history adulatory to scathing in West Mott's terms is to encounter a rather protean presence. One sees biographers building their own Waldos, to borrow a phrase from Bob Hebich. One exists within and beyond the Witcher Bishop paradigm. One pits Emerson the transcendentalist against Emerson the reformer and then one debunks, as Alan Levine and Dan Malachuk do, the myth of Emerson's apolitical individualism, and then reconstructs, as James Albrecht does, Emersonian individualism. One detranscendentalizes and retranscendentalizes, demonstrating, as Joseph Erbus does, the centrality of Emerson's metaphysics to his body of work. One sees, to a certain point, an expanded Emerson canon. One sees a revised narrative of Emerson's post-Civil War years. One considers how Emerson's memory loss and the communality of his late style in Chris Hanlon's terms affects how we read those keynotes such as self-reliance. One concludes with Sarah Wider, there are numerous Emersons and one observes with Stanley Cavell that Emerson has quote, endeared himself both to politically radical and to politically conservative temperaments. The many Emersons one finds in Emerson's reception history says as much, I think, about critical fashions, available texts and methodologies, and cultural needs as they do about Emerson and his work. One could argue that Emerson's studies now are Emerson's studies as they have been and Emerson's studies as they will be, a story of how the scholarship of one generation does not necessarily speak to the needs and interests of another, which is Chris already mentioned. 
if our climate is not Emersonian, at least according to the statistics that Chris shared, then it seems an opportune time to consider not only where we find ourselves, but also how. Um, so look, according to what measures. Richard Poyer suggested in 1987 that quote, Emerson and his influence, if its nuances and skepticisms were deeply enough explored, would prove disturbing, even disruptive of the critical interpretive enterprise as most people practice it. Wes Mott observed in 1989, quote, more often than not, the Academy's view of Emerson has stood at polar extremes from the popular mad image of Emerson, a system of deeper, a symptom, sorry, of deeper cultural divisions. David LaRocca pointed out in 2014 that, quote, several of the most prominent academic critics of Emerson's work undertake metacritical reflections of the academic profession, including its conceptual categories, assigned titles, and accepted disciplines and fields of inquiry. In this way, Emerson's writing retains its ongoing challenge, truly a perpetual provocation to any mode of complacency over the meaning and relevance of the academy. Where, why, and how do we engage with Emerson in classrooms as well as in publications, academic and public facing? And what are the consequences of these modes of engagement? Um, there's a really interesting piece by novelist Garth Greenwell, um, 2020 Harper's essay, Making Meaning Against Relevance in Art. And it opens with a line from Emerson, language is fossil poetry. And he goes on to explore the quote, poem the OED lays out in the case of the word relevant. Um, quote, the common forebear of both relevant and relieve is the French relever, which means originally to put back into an upright position, to raise again, a word that twisted through time, scattering meanings that are two modern words have a portion between them, to ease pain or discomfort, to make stand out, to render prominent or distinct, to rebuild, to reinvigorate, to set free. And I can't help but hear Emerson's sense that the, the scholar's duty, right, is to cheer, to raise, and to guide. And I delight in the idea that demonstrating Emerson's relevance today might mean raising him to view. Um, but in what way do we raise him to view or see him anew? Greenwell reflects, quote, my discomfort with our current use of relevance as a term of judgment is that it conceals its criteria and that those criteria are not aesthetic, but social and political. What does relevance mean in and for Emerson studies? Relevant for whom? Emersonians, Americanists, academics, students, the general public, and relevant for what or to what end? According to what criteria do scholars deem Emerson relevant or irrelevant? And what do various criteria emphasize, dismiss, and assume? Greenwell goes on to say, I worry that if we make such relevance, not just one among other judgments we make about art, but a condition of our interest, we have made that condition purely about the explicit discursive content of art, its subject matter. In doing so, we devalue the elements of a work that to my thinking, properly distinguish it as art. We deny the importance of form. And I don't offer this point so much as a, a call for formalism, old, new, or otherwise as an approach to Emerson, but as a call to think about the condition of our interest in Emerson and its consequences. Um, so to what extent is Emerson's social political relevance the predominant condition of our interest or condition of Emerson's inclusion in courses and conferences and publications? And again, with what consequences? In the specific context of Emerson studies, I think of, of Stanley Cavell's point that the quote unquote high price of the revival of interest in Emerson and John Dewey separately and also together in the context of pragmatism is the way in which quote, Emerson's so-called transcendentalism is largely subordinated to Dewey's pragmatism and the quote, resulting in attention to the details of Emerson's text. What is lost, Cavell asks, if Emerson's voice is lost? 
And along these lines, maybe we could ask what is lost if Emerson's way of thinking is lost, um, thinking of, of Michael Janik's point a few minutes ago. Um, and this sort of leads me to, to questions about paradigms. Um, the late Annette Kolodny in her landmark essay, Dancing Through the Minefield, some observations on the theory, practice, and politics of a feminist literary criticism, reminds us, quote, insofar as we are taught how to read, what we engage are not texts, but paradigms. What paradigms currently shape our encounters with Emerson? In what ways do the imperatives and vocabularies of literary studies today make Emerson's work relevant? And I think there's a difference um, there that's perhaps worth exploring. Jeffrey Insko in his 2019 book, History, Abolition and the Ever-Present Now in Antebellum American Writing, rightly suggests that, quote, we've worked so hard to see what history can teach us about American writers that we've largely failed to see what American writers can teach us about history. And he shows how Emerson, along with contemporaries ranging from Catherine Sedgwick to Frederick Douglass, quote, imagine history as an experience rooted in a fluid, dynamic, ever-changing present, rather than, quote, as a fixed and immutable past with unidirectional movement. Um, what other vocabularies, concepts, and ways of thinking might Emerson help us to unsettle and or to build? I'm wondering about partly the extent to which Emerson's availability to some of the questions that, that Chris mentioned um, remains limited due to the still somewhat narrow Emerson canon. Um, I think that some of the Emerson texts that might fruitfully contribute to these conversations are not necessarily easily accessible or affordable. Thinking of what's in anthologies, for example, um, a material condition that maintains a paradigm privileging a handful of Emerson texts. How, for example, would a Norton critical or broad view edition of the conduct of life or the philosophy of history lecture series or natural history of the intellect complicated as its publication history is, how would that change our engagement with Emerson? I also wonder, and perhaps someone can speak to this here today, if there are any large scale digital editions of Emerson underway, um, something akin to the Whitman archive or the Emily Dickinson archive. Finally, in closing, I, I'm really curious, and this is the sort of pedagogy in the context of the Emerson Society, what is the role of an author society, specifically the Emerson Society, in raising and responding to these kinds of questions? In what ways might the Emerson Society serve as a liaison between Emerson specialists, the broader field, and the general public? If each age it is found must write its own books, or rather each generation for the next succeeding, then what books shall be written now for future readers and how might the Emerson Society support the writing and dissemination of those books? Finally, in response to that perennial question, why read Emerson now? I wonder if it might be necessary to adopt Emerson's double consciousness, to attend with equal rigor to the institutional changes and needs and to the ways in which a remarkably diverse range of individuals across the centuries have found Emerson meaningful. Why is it that so many people devote careers to Emerson or find their everyday lives enriched by Emerson as for example, Mary Barford describes in Emerson Therapy in her contribution to the Transparent Eyeball Third series. I think of writer Mary Oliver's beautiful account of what Emerson means for her. Quote, there are a hundred reasons why I would find my life, not only my literary thoughtful life, but my emotional responsive life impoverished by Emerson's absence. But none is greater than this uncloseting of thought into the world's brilliant perilous present. Why is it that Herwig Friedel, yesterday after receiving the Emerson Society Distinguished Achievement Award said, I cannot let go of Emerson. It seems to me that these questions matter within and well beyond the crises of today and the states of Emerson studies now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Prentice. And finally, Joseph. Okay. Can everyone see the my paper here, yeah? Okay, um, 
just a, uh, a warning before I begin. This is going to be, in a sense, following uh, from Prentice's uh, question on relevance. This is going to be an argument for irrelevance. It's going to be a uh, unapologetically reactionary uh, screed against over politicization of Emerson studies. And uh, I'll begin simply with, a, with a, a bit of background, a bit of broad background. Um, when I first entered graduate school in the early 1980s, um, the profession of literary studies was, was already in a crisis. Uh, and it was already, in my view, this is my take on things, already what I would call a legitimation crisis, uh, borrowing a Habermasian term. One of the responses to, at the time was theory. Theory was one way of uh, giving a certain legitimacy uh, or legitimation to a, to a branch of, uh, of, of scholarly uh, inquiry that seemed in need of uh, justification of a more scientific sort. So the, the fix back then was, was uh, largely epistemological and methodological. This is once again, a personal uh, view of things. Uh, not to say that it wasn't political also. Um, those were pretty heady days, the early 1980s for uh, for politics and theory. If you go back to look at critical inquiry, special issue on, uh, on politics, you'll get a taste of that. Um, so we, here we are 40 years on, um, and I'm, I'm not gonna read this, this statement, but uh, with the American Literary Studies Beyond the Brink webinar, you know, if you haven't seen it, I urge you to see it. Um, one thing I endorse completely is the diagnosis uh, that uh, this, this really is a profession that's beyond the brink, that is uh, peering into the abyss, uh, that it's, uh, we're approaching the demise of the profession as we know it. And I find actually uh, listening to the three participants that my, uh, my assessment was even more pessimistic after than before. Uh, seeing the webinar, in part because of what I, I consider to be almost a complete absence of introspection or soul searching uh, as to uh, not only to various interrelated forces, okay, all of which are, 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 are in place, I'm not uh, contesting that, but the role that our own uh, orientations and particularly political orientations uh, and by political, I mean presentist uh, and activist uh, political orientations have in the decline of the, uh, of the profession. So one of the fixes, okay, after the theoretical and met methodological fix is, is political. I, I see a massive shift, which seems to me to be utterly undeniable uh, toward uh, politicization. Sort of politicizing of our scholarly work. In the SSAWW uh, call for papers, is, this is describes a time when many literary scholars are wondering how our work can, can more directly contribute to struggles for justice and survival. That is a question that I am not asking myself, uh, that I refuse to ask myself. Um, uh, not, not that I don't have political views and convictions, uh, but I try to set them aside in, in a rather old fashioned uh, uh, approach, um, uh, at least for the purposes of inquiry. I'll come back to this a little bit later, uh, later on. Uh, now, to turn to Emerson, I think there's a certain, um, if you like, a certain amount of evidence that Emerson um, uh, that Emerson's position, well, might give us pause, that we might, might uh, wonder in particular uh, about his uh, lifelong critique of busybodies, 
It's something we'll see in a moment, a little bit farther down. William James noticed this. Uh, it, not much escaped James, and what he was able to do is to, to evaluate exactly how important and uh, widespread Emerson's critique of the busybody was. Okay, now um, I, I started with the line from, uh, uh, of course, from Spiritual Laws: "So hot, my little sir," as he's describing. Uh, the activist who goes back into the into the uh, to the bosom of Mother Nature. Um, my point here is the activist imperative. This is what I what I consider the SSAWW uh, call for papers to be expressing a kind of activist or presentist uh, imperative, which I reject categorically. Um, I'm going uh, like Ulysses to to put wax in my ears against those sirens. Um, uh, but it, the problem is it runs up against Emerson's metaphysics, his philosophy of action, and in particular, his critique of willfulness, okay? Uh, now, I'm not going to read through these quotations, but there is one that I really can't resist the temptation to read from Sermon 18, where Emerson is describing what he calls our foolish presumption. If you imagine you were, being, you were called into being for the purpose of taking a leading part in the administration of the world in order to guard one province of moral creation from ruin and that its salvation hangs on the success of your single arm, you have wholly mistaken your business. Uh, now, I'm not going to, 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 to go into this at too much length, but just simply to emphasize that his uh, criticism of the busybody is uh, go, goes it's it's of a piece with his emphasis on concentration his philosophy of power as concentration okay um and also with his critique of i mentioned willfulness spiritual laws in particular is a, 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 a marvelous critique of of the limits of the will of his emphasis on the limits of the will and the critique of uh, human the human will in particular, this uh, emphasis, this goes uh, together with his emphasis on action itself is what he calls secondary testimony, only secondary testimony of our virtues and characters. I think the, the religious background of this is his, uh, is Lutheran in, in the sense of uh, Martin Luther's uh, critique of the doctrine of works as the white devil, okay? Um, I think that's the, distant uh, religious background here uh, that Emerson embraced. So the thing is that uh, I'm just asking um, whether we shouldn't consider what Emerson has to say about uh, meddling, uh, interfering, uh, uh, doing another person's work. Um, we must needs intermeddle and have things our own way until the sacrifices and virtues of society are odious. I think this is what happens sometimes in, in the work that, uh, that, that we're doing today. I think we're, we're overdoing the politics, okay? Now, I, I've just given a set of quotations to show you that the critique of the busybody is actually, it's career-wide. And I give you the James quote in the beginning, the vanity of super serviceableness uh, that James re uh, remarked on. Uh, so there, there really is, it's, 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 it's not anecdotal. This is something, and I'll, I'll repeat this again in just a moment. It's not anecdotal. We're going to the core of Emerson's philosophy here. Now, I'm not saying that we have to agree with Emerson. We can disagree with him on all sorts of, uh, of issues, but we need to keep in mind that if we're going to disagree with him on this particular issue, then uh, we're dealing with the core uh, uh, element of his philosophy. Um, so the source is actually, uh, this is the argument I make in my most recent book, is Plato, is Platonic justice, okay? And I've given you a set of quotations uh, where, particularly the Republic Book Four, uh, which Emerson knew well. And uh, I am convinced that this is uh, the philosophical source, uh, background source of his critique of uh, the busybody. So what does Plato say? What is justice? Socrates is asked, it's doing your own work. It's not being a busybody, okay? It's keeping to your own sphere. 
the habitual practice of one's uh, own proper and natural work in Thomas Taylor's uh, uh, um, translation. And interestingly, Emerson in, in a journal entry um, for 1851, I forgot to put the date there, uh, defends the Republic. He, very interesting, here's the Democrat in the 19th century American Democrat defending Plato against charges of, of, of uh, an aristocratic disdain for, uh, uh, for lo the lowly profession of the cobbler, uh, the man who is, uh, this is his station in life, he shall there, uh, there remain uh, till his dying day. And Emerson makes the point that for him, uh, it's, this is an illustration to show that each passion and action should keep its orbit. I go further to make the point that Emersonian self-trust um, is, which is actually what not being a busybody is for him. Uh, so that we're at, uh, at the core principle here, okay? What is self-trust? It's not being a busybody. It's doing your own work. It's keeping to your own sphere. Uh, and th th this is furthermore uh, a principle of moral and artistic self-constitution, okay? Uh, here I'm, I drew in the, in, in the recent book on Christine Korsgaard's marvelous book on self-constitution, which examines the platonic source. Uh, she does talk about Emerson, but uh, everything she says there is, uh, is pertinent to Emerson as well. Um, and you can see this in the journal uh, quote I give here, uh, to every reproach I know, but one answer, namely to go again to my own work not the work of another. Um, and I've given, given you a set of other quotes here of, of, you know, to, back my, uh, to back my point. Even interestingly, this one from spiritual laws where we see that it's not only moral self-constitution that doing your own work or uh, um, sticking to your own sphere uh, uh, implies, but artistic self-constitution. And I quote, by doing his own work, the poet makes the need felt which he can, he can supply and creates the taste by which he is enjoyed. By doing his own work, he unfolds himself. So this is the really Emersonian self-trust is a modernization of platonic justice, okay? Uh, but the core definition is the same, even with Emerson's, uh, uh, if you like, modernization for the, uh, in, in the context of uh, a modern democratic society. Now, you're probably going to object to uh, this, this reactionary position that I'm taking that, well, what about Emerson's anti-slavery activism? Yes, I, uh, I acknowledge that what that uh, suggests is that there's a time and place for activism and public philosophy. The time came history brought it home to Emerson. And uh, uh, still at the same time, I don't see it as a break with his uh, metaphysics or his, uh, or his ethics, uh, but rather uh, it's, 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 it's still Emerson doing his own work. When he's writing the anti-slavery texts, it's still Emerson doing his own work. It has a political application, of course. Uh, but the point there is that for me, at least this is my take, that it's not really, uh, it's not so much activism and still less conformism as wise and timely action untaken by free individual expressing his character or doing what strictly belongs to him, okay? And here I give a quote from, from Reforms where he says, where he, he does give us some sense of uh, this question of timeliness, okay? And the opportune moment, uh, the kairos uh, for the Greek uh, term. Uh, uh, but whilst a man keeps himself thus sacred and aloof from the common vi vices of the partisan, let him only abide his time and not hold himself excused from any sacrifice when he finds a clear case on which he is called to stand his trial. Let him not like our 11,000 martyrs expend himself in petulance when no need is. So what I'm arguing for is that uh, this is, it's, it's a suggestion 
a modest proposal that we return to our, our own work. We are not uh, political operatives. We're not climatologists. Uh, we're literary scholars. Uh, and uh, this is my point in making my argument for irrelevance. Uh, I think that I begin with the term respect. I think that, uh, I'll quote Emerson here, I believe that our own experience instructs us that the secret of education lies in respecting the pupil. I'm actually, I make a point of, um, uh, if you like, not trying to impose my political views on my uh, students. Uh, uh, so I find that is, Disrespecting, disrespecting them, even if I, 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 I have this burning urge to do so. Um, I'm for saving, uh, I never thought I'd be quoting Stanley Fish publicly, but here, here I am. Uh, I agree with him on saving the world on our own time, not that of our institutions, colleagues, and students. And somewhere in Emerson, he says that the first duty of the teacher is to protect the student against his own influence. I haven't been able, I'm not, I'm not making it up. It's in there somewhere. Uh, another uh, reason uh, to return to our own work is distraction and conformism, okay? Um, one is when you think about Emerson's religion, can we really say that we have even begun to understand Emerson's religion. I don't think we've even scratched the surface. Uh, so that means that we should do our own work and concentrate on what we're good at. Uh, uh, another um, reason is to avoid conformism. The objection to conforming to usages that have become dead to you is that it scatters your force, it loses your time and blurs the impression of your character. But do your work and I shall know you. Do your work and you shall reinforce yourself. Uh, another point I'd like to make, and I'm, I'm wrapping up very quickly here, is that, uh, and this is a strong opinion, a lot of you probably won't agree with this, but I think our political opinions are the least interesting and least often least original thing about us particularly these days, since politics is precisely the area where viewpoint diversity in the academy is fast approaching zero. The recent uh, poll of 260 uh, Harvard University professors, of that 260, 4% uh, self-identified as conservative or very conservative. This is a problem. Uh, and I think it affects our choice of topics. Huh? Uh, as uh, Emerson Society program chair, I've often wondered, I, don't, I, don't, I, I refuse to give the prompt, but I often wondered if anyone would come up with a subject like uh, Emerson and conservatism, okay? Uh, not likely, uh, but uh, this is an essential question. You know, uh, can we treat uh, conservatism in the period, to borrow the terms of Mark Lilla, is anything, is something other than a pathology, okay? That, uh, the, that the conservative strain in Emerson's thinking, and for me, uh, there, uh, it's indisputable that there is one. Uh, so all we have to do is read the lecture of uh, the conservative to, to see that. Also recall the, the, the tremendous admiration he had for Burke. Uh, my final point would be simply that uh, political, and here I'm calling on, on Charles Sanders' purse, uh, politi politicizing scholarship, in other words, requiring that our scholarship uh, serve the interests of present uh, political uh, causes, blocks the way of inquiry, as Purse put it. I love this quotation. Uh, where he uh, talks about, he's describing what he calls the rule of, uh, the rule of reason, okay? Uh, in order to learn, you must desire to learn and in so desire not be satisfied with what you already incline to think. I would apply that to politics also. Uh, there follows a cor corollary which itself deserves to be inscribed upon every wall of the city of philosophy. Do not block the way of inquiry. Um, and here uh, I'll close very quickly with uh, two quotes from uh, Susan Hack, a Purse scholar, 
Uh, I agree with her uh, a thousand percent here. Politicization of inquiry, whether in the interest of good political values or bad, I can understand the desire to further. Oh, can I understand the, the desire to, to further good political values uh, or bad is always epistemologically unsound. Actually, absolutely agree with her on that point. The idea that inquiry should be politicized, not just misconception, but a politically dangerous misconception because of the potential for tyranny of calls, calls for politically adequate research and scholarship, okay? I'm thinking about the University of Chicago English Department's decision uh, to accept uh, master's theses on race only, okay? To me, that's blocking the road uh, for in, uh, to inquiry. So my final suggestion, let's do our own work. Um, uh, let's not expend ourselves in petulance. I'll let you read through the rest of, uh, of that paragraph at your leisure. And I, uh, I will place myself under the aegis of, uh, of uh, Théophile Gautier, who wrote a wonderful collection of po poems, Émos et Camille, adopting a resolutely uh, uh, anti-political stance. He turns his back, this is, Published in, began the work in 1852. This is after the 1848 revolutions, simply turning his back on politics and concentrating on poetry and, uh, uh, and appealing to the example of Goethe as his, uh, as his model there. Uh, so I thank you for uh, listening patiently and courteously uh, to this uh, uh, resolutely. Um, uh, uh, resolutely, as I say, uh, reactionary take on politicizing Emerson scholarship. Thank you, Joseph. And thank you to all of our roundtable panelists. Um, so much to talk about here. I um, really enjoyed listening to all of them and thinking about the ways that these uh, these talks really are in conversation with one another. And um, first of all, I just want to say, I think a panel on Emerson and conservatism sounds like a really fascinating idea. There is a ton to do with that. And um, yeah, let's not hold back, right? <laughs> um, and if I could just sort of generalize, just to kick things off about some of the things that I heard in this conversation, um, the word presentism is what's coming to mind, is how, whether and how we should be presentist in our approach to Emerson, um, whether that's in terms of the, the, the critical and theoretical concerns that are percolating in the field at the moment where Chris started things off or politically where Joseph took us at the end here. Um, and and uh, to, to address that in a way that I think um, Prentice gave us is whose interests does such presentism in any form serve and how does it do so? Um, and I would just also like to throw out maybe in anticipation perhaps of some of the conversation to follow, thinking about the ways in which, and Joseph, you may disagree, that our work, whether what is it to do our own work and in what ways is it, as we say, always already political, especially for those of us who are at public institutions. Um, so whether we want it to be or not, right? Um, so I, I'm just gonna leave those sort of sort of comments, but I really wanna hear what others have to say, which I'm sure is, is uh, <clears throat> abundant. Can I just follow really quick following Bonnie, but that following on that question, like, isn't our work always already political? I, I just heard, Joseph, this is like an absolutely genuine question. In some ways, your explication of Emerson's critique of busybodies seems to me like not a, um, a sort of resistance to activist imperatives, but exactly the kind of contribution to those conversations we need. Why not? <laughs> Why not? I think so someone has to, uh, I'm bending the stick very far in the opposite direction, obviously. Uh, 
but I think someone has to do it um, at some point because it's really, it's an over, um, my feeling is one of an overdose of, it's kind of all politics all the time. And uh, I just think it, it's, it's unhealthy. And I don't think it's, uh, it's true when we're working for, I think, Bonnie, my response is when I'm, I'm working also for a public institution and I'm sure I've been been in, in disfigured by the French experience. The French civil service is is very, or traditionally, this is going by the wayside, but traditionally, uh, very acheval, very uh, strict about the neutrality of education of the classroom uh, of the university, um, the political neutrality uh, in particular. And also religious, um, uh, but particularly for secondary schools, but it also extends to university. So I, I would say that uh, that's more or less an argument for for not being a busybody, or not politicking in the classroom, or not instrumentalizing the, the classroom for activist purposes. This is reminding me a little of a complaint I recently received from a student. Um, my actually my director drew my attention to a complaint that actually made it the way all the way to my provost because they just only because they wanted to make sure it didn't have any you know media legs the student was complaining that my course was um politically biased this is this last semester a course titled U united states multi-ethnic literature and the student went on to explain that my political bias um was a bias against slavery <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the funny thing is the student then went on to say that anti-slavery thought was inherently democratic with, with a capital D, which of course, as we know, is the opposite is true. So if anything, my course was biased in the direction of Republicans. Um, but, um, but it, you know, I, I, get, I, I also, it strikes me also, Joseph, that your, you know, your, your opposition to activism is itself a form of activism. There, there's, there are, there are, inherently an unavoidable political politics behind, um, you know, looking at what, what you say happened at Chicago, but not what happened at Chapel Hill. Um, if, if I may re reply quickly there, um, it, it's, a, it's a regulative ideal in the Kantian sense that I'm, that I'm, that I'm uh, following here. Um, the argument that, well, we're always uh, already necessarily political um, is not an argument that I find very convincing. And uh, it still doesn't relieve us of the obligation to at least attempt to, uh, at least for the, for, for the purposes of inquiry, for the reasons Peirce points out, uh, simply make sure that our, that our presentist concerns are not blocking the road to inquiry. We have to wonder, I, I use the example of Emerson's religion, why so little research on Emerson's religion? Uh, and if you simply weigh the amount of publications on the religion versus say, I don't know, politics or race. Uh, there's no, there's no okay, just, just so, real quick, and then I, no? just, oh, sorry, just, just real quick to that point, and I, and I think Sandra had her hand up, I'd love to hear from her as well, but um, uh, there will be three chapters in the Oxford Handbook on Emerson and religion. Uh, his commitment to Methodism, uh, uh, Unitarianism, and secularism. Uh, and there'll be, I think, five on Emerson and climate. So, could I ask a question? Yeah, uh, please. Thank you. Chris, you've segued beautifully to my question, and that is, I'm not aware of your table of contents for the Oxford Handbook. So I'm wondering, as someone who increasingly has great difficulty teaching Emerson in central Pennsylvania where they haven't heard of him and they find Henry Thoreau, of course, as a Thoreauvian, much to my delight, much easier and more applicable and more relevant. Um, so I would like to know whether you have any kind of pedagogy section in the Oxford Handbook and, and especially if it is social justice oriented because my students are asking for that. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. Um, the, the, you probably know this from your own editorial work. I mean, you know, you start off with one way of organizing all these chapters by brilliant people, and you know, the best laid plans go awry. At one point, I had a pedagogy section, and at this point, the, some of those chapters have been enfolded into a section called uh, "Building Emerson," uh, you know, another homage to Habich, the second of the of the day. 
um, you know, chapters about um, teaching Emerson that are right next to chapters, for instance, about the challenges of editing Emerson, Ron Bosco and Joel Meyerson, I'm, I'm very fortunate are contributing a chapter um, in that way. Um, the question about um, social justice, um, this too has proven a ch has proven protean for me as editor. I, I once had a section that was titled Black Lives. Um, you know, uh, my chapters solicited from people like Bridget Fielder, Derek Spires, you know, other people who are working on, on uh, in, you know, enhancing our understanding of the abolition movement and what came after. Um, then at a certain point, I realized, you know, th th this sequestration of of work that is focused on racial justice, it, it kind of misrepresents the way Emerson thought about social, about racial justice, I think. Um, so so that's, a, that's a way of punting on your great question a little bit, uh, Sandra. Um, but just one last thing I wanna say, um, you know, I, you, you're right, Emerson, teaching Emerson is so hard because, you know, I mean, we all know what it's like, right? His, his language is so, um, unbelievably rich and dense and like, you know, the way his words pressure one another to produce, you know, various phenomena of meaning is, is so challenging for our students and so important, right, that, that they, that some of them meet that challenge at least some of the time, at least, you know, I know we all want to meet that challenge at least some of the time. But the thing I find when I, when I talk about Emerson, for example, and his, his very famous uh, letter and wonderful Example of Sonian rhetoric, his letter to President Van Buren on the on the Cherokee of the room, Cherokee removal, you know, his refusal to stand by silently while that genocide occurred, um, is that you know students get lit up by it. They they have they have no trouble on their own, you know, connecting an outrage like the removal of um, the Cherokee um, to what is happening at the border now in the United States, for example. And, and I've seen them do this quite on their own. I, God, I hope, I hope I never sort of feel so unconfident that I need 18 year olds to agree with me politically. But what, but what I see them do on their own is to sort of notice all the ways in which his rhetorical points, you know, the tack he takes in that letter could be so easily sort of, you know, either applied to our own moment or recognized in the words of some of our more inspiring politicians. I hope that's not too rambling, but thank you for that question, Sandra. Thank you. That's that's very helpful, and it 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 also dovetails with the way that Thoreau's political essays, anti-slavery essays, John Brown, and so forth, have become so much more teachable and interesting to students than civil disobedience and Walden. But thank you. You find your students responding to, for instance, Thoreau's uh, eulogy for John Brown. Yeah, especially we're so close. We take field trips there. And so we're standing in the engine house usually when they have just finished reading it and we're talking about it. So that's, that's something that's just worked out well for us over the last several years. Dave Greenham, you've had your hand up a bit. Yeah, thanks Brentis. Um, yeah, I've got um, a few points. I wanna come in um, where Chris ended his talk on thinking about Emerson and the Anthropocene and Emerson in nature and I guess the best way to think about Emerson there really is he was a major part of the problem. For Emerson, nature is a resource for humans. It's created for humans. Nature's kind of, humans only came along when nature was ready for them to use. And I think kind of materially, metaphorically and metaphysically, he is a part of the problem when it comes to nature. And I think I'd be really interested to understand him on those terms. It is a resource, it's something to use as a commodity rather and you know, I think that's, that's kind of a way to go with Emerson there, rather than necessarily thinking about him as a proto-environmentalist, which I think is how he's often be seen. Uh, so I want to probably want to go there and think of him as part of the problem there. I think perhaps in terms of Emerson's popularity, in terms of why he's difficult to teach, why he's difficult to read, I guess it's the essay as form. You know, um, people will always, students will always respond better to novels, short stories than they do to essays. It's a really tricky form to teach and they're not straightforward anyway you know and often he's a kind of gateway author you know you're teaching the American Renaissance you begin with Emerson and you move on to Hawthorne or Poe or Melville Dickinson and the students always write on those and you think I put all my best work into Emerson you get very little back but you know it's a uh, it's that's kind of a, a challenge as well and then um, finally I'm thinking about the position of the young academic coming into work on something like Emerson and 
and then picking up Joseph's point about trying to find their own place, trying to do their own work. In the UK, um, it's pretty much impossible at the moment to do your own work, um, just to follow your nose. Curiosity-led research is, is a privilege of a few places, a few very well kind of healed places, but certainly where I work out in sticks, this doesn't happen. Um, instead, we have something called the impact agenda. Research with impact is what matters. And what impact means is that your research has to have, in order to have any value, it has to have direct beneficiaries outside of the academy. Okay, so my work on Emerson and Metaphor, that's never gonna go there. I just do it when I can. I'm pretty lucky because of the situation I'm in my own institution. I do get a bit of time to do this. But a young academic coming through now, they're not really gonna be able to do their own work outside of a very small number of privileged institutions in the UK. They're gonna to have to find ways of making Emerson matter, of making him relevant, to come back to Prentice's point, and making him relevant to that wider community outside of the HEI. Otherwise, they're not gonna get funding. They're not gonna get, you know, they're not gonna be able to get their work out there into the world. So they've got to kind of accommodate themselves to that. And therefore, coming back to why Emerson is relevant, how we engage with him is gonna really matter if we're gonna bring through, I think, younger academics into this, into this field, which, you know, for us in, in our middle or late careers, it's not such a problem, you know, but I do think it is for those coming through. Hey, one quick word response to your first remark, uh, Dave. Um, yeah, you're right. Like, you know, Emerson, you know, Emerson's language around ecology and the environment and extraction infrastructure. Um, well, I guess part of my point today was that we we don't know really what is that because we haven't really undertaken that that exploration. But I suspect you're right that it's not going to all reflect um, in a sunny way on every aspect of ever wrote. And is a reason to do it. Right? I think nothing is more lethal to uh, a, an author than a sense in which the scholars writing about that author are. Um, some kind of admiration society, right, like that. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that that's what's happening in the Emerson Society, for instance. I, I you know, I, I read deeply in all of your work, and there's, there's, there's no, there are no punches pulled. But um, I, I imagine the section on climate uh, essays that will be in my volume will, um, you know, take up all kinds of um, views of Emerson's view of the world and what it's for. Sue, I think you had your hand up before. Oh, well, I was thinking about something um, Chris was saying about that, the complaint you had in your class. And, uh, you know, I think that's one of the, in, in teaching, there is, uh, you use the term um, regulation or regulative or something like that, Joseph. Um, but I think there is that, that sense of trying to restrain your own, um, your own feelings. I had a similar thing. Teach, I was teaching a world religions class and, and well into it. A student came up to me afterwards and said, "Okay, so you know we've learned all this stuff about, but what do you think? What what do you, what is your religion?" And I, I kind of thought that's irrelevant <laughs> you know, to it. Um, and the other thing, um, this this term "relevant," I I find um, etymology is fascinating, and I'm so glad you brought that up, um, Prentice, um, because it sounds like relevant is originally in the sense of a transitive verb and we use it as an adjective all the time now. And I think, I think thinking about it as a verb as something we do to Emerson is, is an interesting, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what I think about that but I think it matters <laughs> whether, whether we're thinking of it as something we do to Emerson or a way we describe or want to describe Emerson as, as being. It strikes me as a very Emersonian way of approaching something, right? That it's something that does, it transforms, it changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like that's what he wants to do. I mean, I think of that, I think it's Lawrence Buell that says, you know, Emerson wants to be useful and he's, he so wants that, that, you know, you can throw him out if you're, if you're not finding him useful. Yeah. Basically ask you to throw him out if you're not finding him useful. Mm -hmm. It's all about who comes after him having their own readings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I was just going to ask, you know, how can we then honor Emerson's, uh, uh, you know, honor Emerson by use, right? What he, he encourages us to do, right? Not that we're going to leave him behind completely. The problem is not so much that I can't lo- let go of Emerson, but that Emerson won't let go of me. And, and so it's, it's a kind of a, you know, it's a kind of an issue. I think what Emerson does kind of in response to Joseph's uh, uh, provocation is he has us think about that role of the public intellectual, right? How do we speak for, right? What are the possibilities for advocacy? Right, that we might have from our privileged positions, from uh, you know a predominantly white academy, et cetera, et cetera. Right? How do we speak for? Right? Can we speak for? What are the sort of problematics of speaking for others or for speaking for the earth in various ways? Um, and you know, there's some contributions in, in the Cambridge Companion too around uh, climate ecology as well. Um, but I don't know. I mean, they, I think they stress the kind of Emerson's relational ontology as a way to think towards you know, how we can think about ecology, while not at the same time eliding Emerson's kind of situation in 19th century thermodynamics and the sort of, uh, you know, revving up of the Anthropocene. Um, But in terms of, you know, what these books can do, right, whether uh, Chris's handbook or the one I'm editing or Prentice's work or any of our work, right, I don't think, you know, through uh, printing the books and distributing that we're going to reach net zero sustainability, right, but I'm rather more doing about it to think that, you know, art, and hopefully scholarship is the transfer of energy, right? And something that will be played forward in, you know, probably instrumentalized, but also not instrumentalized ways, right? To kind of keep a balance of relevancy and irrelevancy where irrelevancy can be a kind of subversive force away, you know, against the ways in which the humanities are, uh, you know, taken up in terms of impact or in terms of, you know, sort of bottom lines, right? And it's really hard to scope out that place, but we have to, I think, fight for it. Right, we have to fight for our own irrelevancy, if you like, right, or our own ability to indulge irrelevancy, right, and and perversely that might make us all the more relevant, right? Because I know it's a big discussion in the UK about you know what what is the role of the humanities, and a lot of my colleagues and I'm uh, you know in a sort of broad media arts and humanities school are thinking about how uh, you know the humanities can s- explain AI to the informatics people or ecology to the sustainability people. And we can do things towards that. I have you know, more optimism than you, Joseph, when it comes to that. But at the same time, we also think about the history of literature and form and poetics and these things, which have a sort of value and can help us and will help future people down the line to right, uh, you know, think science or think uh, technology or think the environment, et cetera. Excellent point, Michael, if I can jump in here, uh, about the transfer of energy. And here's one of, one of my fears, is that there are students like myself um, who didn't come to literary studies uh, out, of a, uh, out of a passion for politics, uh, all the while being extremely politicized when I was, uh, when I did enter graduate school, but that's not, that's not what enchanted me. That's not, that's not what got me, uh, got me passionate about, uh, about this particular field. Uh, you know, it's, Sue's question, Sue's remark about religion uh, reminds me of a student who came up to me one day after doing a, uh, a class on, on the poetry of the period from Emerson to, to, uh, to Monarch to Frost. And the student said, "Well, you know, uh, wow, you you must be you must be a poet to to talk about the poetry in that way to, to people who don't receive that energy you're kind of trying to transfer typically, okay? Uh, who have uh, reservations about the genre uh, uh, that you know I had to be a poet. He, he was convinced that I had to be a poet. I said, I'm not a poet at all." Uh, um, and so I took it as a, a kind of unintentional compliment. Uh, so it's it's the uh, I, I fear that we're we're going to to give you one example from from the uh, from the Penn State uh, webinar. Um, um, Jeff, Jeffrey Nealon, I believe, is the last uh, contributor. He said he says, okay, well. Our literary studies departments are basically going to be theory departments. Um, why? 
But I, I, I think I, if I were a graduate student, would not enroll in the theory department. A philosophy department, absolutely. Something called a theory department where there are no objects that are called literary objects that pre-exist the theoretical model that, that calls them into being. I think that's more of a problem than a solution to the, to the predicament of uh, imminent demise of the, uh, of the field of study. So it's the kind of, kind of getting back to what was said about moral sentiment, uh, what Michael was saying about poetic thinking and, and, and uh, Prentice about, uh, about relevance. Uh, there are some students that we are losing by becoming presentist, activist, overly technical, and not getting back to something that Dave uh, uh, talked about, uh, I thought very courageously back in Syracuse, New York, you, Dave, did a, uh, Dave Greenham did a piece on appreciation. Uh, the um, uh, Penn State webinar speaks of appreciation in very well depreciative terms, dare I say. And uh, one of the ways that Michael, that we're gonna get those, those people um, to, uh, to be uh, vectors for the transfer of energy, there's an appreci appreciation element there. You know? uh, whether it's immediate, this, the whole problem is we can't of course quantify it in immediately uh, profitable terms. Uh, but anyway, I'll stop, stop there. Could I respond just briefly? Uh, and, and Joseph and I, by the way, are, we're, we're good friends, by the way. <laughs> we don't agree on this. But, um, but you know, like, I mean, just two things, Joseph. Like, I mean, number, number one, I, I mean, I'm glad to be back in the theory wars. I thought they were over 20 years ago. <laughs> but what I remember from back then, my own experience of, of theory, you know, in the 90s, not, not during the 80s as you refer to, wasn't that like the people, I, 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 was, I, I was engaged with it by the way, I wrote a dissertation on Lacan and Emerson. And, uh, and I remember not feeling that anyone was selling theory as a, as a way to sell literary studies as a, as a solution. I remember people were engaged with it because it was so fascinating. Utterly fascinating, like so rich, and and, that, and you know I don't I don't myself speaking for myself I, I don't refer or footnote people like Lacan or Derrida very much at all, if at all, and I don't see those footnotes appearing in the pages of J nineteen or AL or ALH or PMLA. But the way that generation that generation of graduate students was shaped all the way down by those styles of thinking cannot be understated. Uh, it, it has everything to do with the way we teach, the way we read. And so on, um, and just just to pivot to one other point, I, I don't think that's the important part of what you're you're offering today. The important part to me is what you've just sort of described as your fear that you know what you're calling activism or presentism or or and so on has the potential to sap what is you know important or and beautiful and 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 um, wondrous about literature. I'm really reminded of Richard Rorty's chapter from, I think it was his last book where he called, it had a provocative title. It was something like, it was some homage to Harold Bloom. Um, and, um, and he kind of argues this, he says, you know, you know, Bloom teaches us or that if we, if we suck the wonderment out of literary studies by making it cultural studies, um, you know, we'll go the way that philosophy departments went when they became analytical philosophy departments instead of metaph metaphysical philosophy departments. And, you know, my response to that at the time was to think, huh, you know, I remember being in a, cl a class on John Donne where the professor um, introduced us to that poem, Elegy 19, which is like a, it's like a strip tease, you know, it's done trying to seduce and done something like that. And, or, and um, and it's kind of, you know, I, I, to be honest, I didn't find it. <laughs> you know, I was doing the assigned reading. But, but then when that professor pointed to a line and said, look at this line where Dunn makes this sort of dirty joke where he's, he's, he's trying to convince the female listener to, to take off her clothes. And, and he says, what? Dost thou needs more, needs more covering than a man? And he kind of said, so the joke is that like, he's gonna cover her or something like that, you know? But then he, point, then he taught us a bit about 
the pressing of Anne Clitheroe, Margaret Clitheroe, the Catholic martyr uh, in York. And talk to us about the way that story was circulating when Dunn was writing this. And he suddenly taught us that this was absolutely a cultural object. You, you, you know, understanding political valiance, what Dunn was saying about what was happening in England in terms of religious martyrs, Catholics like himself being executed. It just lit the poem up for me. It, 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 not because it was beautiful, but because it was monstrous. And, um, and I, I never forget that class. It, he, that person saved me from failing to recognize what a what an intensely intriguing object is LG19. This discussion is reminding me of an essay that I have read relatively recently by Susan Manning on pleasure as being, she talks about it as being kind of like the the secret curriculum of in, of the English department and in sort of worrying about well should we let on or not <laughs> and I, I think about that essay a lot when I sit on curriculum committees and think about you know learning outcomes and uh, criteria for for evaluation and assessment um, and and thinking about how that fits in with the work that we're that we why we came to Emerson and that we want to bring out of Emerson in our scholarship moving forward. Um, I am mindful of the time. Do we have any closing questions, further points to discuss before we, am I right that we're winding down here? I was hoping, I was hoping there'd be a chance to ask Prentice if she could talk a little bit more about the, the remarks she made at the end of her talk, which I found so provocative about the importance of transforming our own arrest with Emerson into an object of study in itself, if that's not a bad way to, um, to um, you know, paraphrase your, your, your provocation, Prentice. Yeah, but I've seen that Wes has had his hand up several times. So I'd actually, I, would, I was curious to, to hear what you wanted to say, Wes. Well, go, I, I wanted you to have last word, Prentice. I, I want to say, Two things. One is I've been scrambling, making notes here about how provocative this whole program has been, both programs today. <clears throat> and I was going to say that I think it's the ideal tonic to use the um, a term that's related to some of the medical discussions we've had today. It's the wonderful tonic for the pandemic lethargy that I find my brain still being in. So thank you all from both panels for really stimulating my mind. I won't bore you with the five comments I've um, I've written down here that I would go into in some detail in a later time, but you've got my mind going and. Um, Prentice, I, I, I also would like to follow up with what you have to say to finish us up here. But thank you all for being here. It's good to see you all. Well, Chris, Chris, Prentice, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> now that was, I was sort of like so attentive to, to Wes. Can, Chris, can you sort of rephrase what you wanted me to, to follow up on? Yeah, I just, and this isn't how you put it, but it, but it struck me that near the end of the talk, you were sort of, you were sort of suggest that one thing that's really important is for us to sort of um, think about what it is about em Emerson that arrests us so much. And, and, and I think I heard you also suggesting that part of that study has to involve some curiosity about how that state of arrest situates within larger contexts, professional context, social context, you know, whatever. Is that, is that do I have you yeah, that's what I had, was sort of beginning to think through that I haven't done all the way, just that sort of balancing of, of those questions that really struck me, like um, Professor Fradel's point yesterday when he said, like, I can't let go of Emerson, like after a lifetime of work and that, that, that massive book that's loaded with life, right, like thinking in search of a language, like why he still is, is arrested by Emerson or... Um, so like balancing those kinds of questions, like why is that, right? That someone's devoted a lifetime to Emerson. How do we balance that with the very real institutional needs, right? I mean, I, I was at the same um, webinar, Joseph, um, American Studies Beyond the Brink, and I too was struck by that comment that the shift in our discipline, right? From objects of study to methods of study. But then I feel like it always comes back to why Emerson is so helpful because he says like, here are all these questions. Why are we debating he's successful at morning or he's not successful? He's relevant, he's not relevant. What is? What are the questions that are at the heart of those seeming um, poles, right? And, and, and so I think two of, um, I don't know, like Emerson, if, we, if we're thinking about methods of study, Emerson seems to have so much to teach us about methods of study that non-literary objects, right? Like 
Emerson as literature, what can, what can he teach us about thinking, right? That other texts that can't. And that seems to be a question that's, that's relevant in many ways, but also just um, the way that I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of, of Ron Bosco and Joel Meyerson, um, when they describe Emerson as one of America's greatest questioners. And I feel like that sort of speaking to your, your point too, Chris, like it seems we need now more than ever, like not only a questioner, but somebody, a questioner who demonstrates how to question, right? Like thinking of students and their struggle to raise questions and formulate questions and how Emerson is such a good teacher of observing what seem to be givens, right? Our system of education, history, our relationship to the natural world. He takes these, these givens and he shows us how to consider them you know, anew, right? As, as if for the first time, what is, what is summer? What is a day? What is woman? To our blindness, these things seem unaffecting. So I think a part of it is, you know, relevance, irrelevance. Well, what's at the heart of those words and how does Emerson help us to interrogate those words? Um, I don't know, just a jumble of thoughts. Cause again, it's so much to think about everybody's, everybody's responses. I think we've all got a bit of a jumble of thoughts at the moment, and um, that's a good thing. And it's a good thing to take away from this wonderful couple of hours this morning. Um, Wendell, I'm sorry, I, did you raise your hand a second ago? Yes, I wanted to uh, have a minute if I could. Sure, and then we'll wind up. One of the things that uh, we're all good at, uh, especially you who are literary scholars yourselves, uh, is the objective work and uh, the writing. But one of the things that Emerson offers that can be the invisible and what he meant, the reason for the humanities is the perception part. It is as the poet, we, we address our being in the beholding of nature and in the beholding of others, in the beholding of other ideas and beings. And so the uh, dearth of religious writing is part of, uh, is that we ourselves have to um, uh, allow ourselves that, um, the inquiry that was spoken about, allow ourselves to let perception be a bigger part of our inquiry. And, and we have so much misinformation going on that even just the whole idea of, of uh, self-critiquing and opening our perception. And um, like Emerson says that the sun shines into the heart of the child. Um, that moment of perception, that, that address to being is one of the th great values of Emerson that I see as the, the, the lesser academic of the scholars here today. And, and but what is the gift, a great gift to the world? And uh, I'll stop there. Thank you for that, Wendell. I think that that's a excellent place to conclude and, and to think about, um, about, about perception in, um, in Emerson and, uh, and in our teaching and our criticism and how it relates to all of our thinking. Um, so thank you all for a wonderful round table, a wonderful morning. Um, I know I'll be bubbling with thoughts for days to come from all of this. So um, I'll carry it all forward and I can't wait to see what comes out of it in the next year or so. Uh, be well, stay well, and hope to see you back here, maybe in person uh, next time around. Take care. Mm -hmm.